Well, several years ago, LifeWay Research conducted a study of what Americans were planning for their New Year's resolution. Now, I'm sure it's no surprise to any of us to find out that amongst the top of the list were things like spending time more wisely and saving money instead of spending it, improving relationships with estranged family members or maybe distant friends. All of these were at the top of the list. But there was one thing that did surprise me personally because it was number two in response to this New Year resolution survey, only slightly behind healthier habits, exercise, eating, all that stuff. But number two on the list, across a large swath of all Americans, religious, Christian, all that stuff, was having a better relationship with God. I find that kind of surprising because God talk seems so gauche in public. And yet, when it comes to our hopes about improving our life in the coming year and our personal life and our secret life, a large swath of people in our society, even just vaguely spiritual people, seem somewhat concerned about getting a better grasp on the divine, longing for some kind of fulfillment that can only come in their life spiritually. But we all know a vast majority of our New Year's resolutions fall by the wayside and usually before it's even February. Why? Well, because as the old prayer book says, there is no health in us. Spiritual health, physical health, mental health. The problem with the whole new year, new me mentality is that we first have to deal with the old us and all the consequences of his or her old problems from our old years. So it's no wonder, I think, that so many people, after the festivity of Christmas time, the singing, the lights, the, the feasting, the, the presents, it's no wonder why so many people come into this month and feel a bit depressed. Because another year is gone, and what do we have to show for it? Maybe a few more wrinkles, a few more aches and pains, a few more medications we have to take, a few more doctor's appointments we have to go to, and a few more problems to say the least. Most of us, if we're realistic enough with ourselves, admit that we're the kind of people that always seem to get bogged down in Leviticus in late January and early February. And we stay that way for the rest of the year, remaining completely unchanged. We just aren't the people that have the personal fortitude to pray more and to eat better and to exercise more, and to read more books, or to watch less TV, or to call old friends more often. And we're certainly not the people that seem to have the willpower to get any closer to the Lord. Why? Because we just can't overcome that old year and that old us. And truly, there is no health in us. But do you know how that historic Christian prayer ends? Truly, there is no health in us, they say, but Thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Huh. That's more than just a request, I think. As in, have mercy on us. But it's a promise too. Have mercy on us, Lord. There is no health in us, spiritually, physically, emotionally, socially, financially, mentally, or otherwise. And if we're honest, we are miserable offenders. We offend each other, we offend ourselves, and we offend, worst of all, God with our hypocrisy and unfaithfulness. But did you know there is actual, real potential for this new year to truly be happy for you? Do you know how? It is not by your willpower to make any sort of self-improvement but rather antithetically to our can-do entrepreneurial American spirit, we may enjoy the sure promise of the year of the Lord's favor by the power of His Holy Spirit descending on the shoulders of Jesus who was born, lived, suffered, died, rose, and ascended for you.
Not the new and improved you, but the old, miserable offender you. (laughs) And that's what this passage is all about. Not what you can do for yourself, but what He has and is doing for you. So let's look together at the text this morning. Now, this passage of Scripture is familiar to us as readers of the Gospel because it's in the fourth chapter of Luke that we read when Jesus was approximately 30 years old. In other words, when He Himself was entering into a new year, a new era of His life. When He as a Jewish man was now of the right age to be a minister of God's Word. They didn't let these rabbis and and priests enter into that role until they were at least 30 years old. Well, now he is of the right age and the right time to minister God's Word to God's people. And he begins in his own hometown of Nazareth on a Saturday, their Sabbath day. When they come together to, to worship and meditate on God's Word, Jesus comes up to the pulpit not unlike this one, and he grabs the scroll of Isaiah. They didn't have these folios, these codexes. They didn't have books like us. He got a big scroll, and he unwound the thing, and he got to the passage, which we call Isaiah 61, and he read it to us. Or he read it to them, rather. And do you know what his closing word was? It was not the word of the Lord, as we say. But rather, Jesus said, today, as you listen, this Scripture has been fulfilled. That's a deviation from the standard text. And it made people perk up, no doubt. Because what Jesus was saying is that the Word made flesh has fulfilled this written Word of promise. Jesus, the one and only God-man, has kept God's promises to men and women as only God could. And it was with the utmost humility that He spoke this truth to power, scandalizing all us religious folks who think that if we uh, can only pretend that we can lie and cheat and hypocritize our way into the Lord's favor. But the year of the Lord's favor is not because of anything we do or usher in. It's because what the Lord has and is doing exclusively through Jesus of Nazareth. Verse 1, The Spirit of the Lord God is on me because the Lord has anointed me. That's where we get the word Messiah from. He has messiahed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and freedom to the prisoners. Now this is a clear reference to Israel's never observed command from God in Leviticus 25, where they were to every seven years and then every 50 years rather, seven times seven, 49, they were to observe a year of jubilee. A year where all their societal debts were absolved. Where all bond servants and slaves were freed. Where uh, lost wealth was restored to families. Where lost titles and deeds to lands went back to their descendants. It was an economic reset that helped out the poorest of the poor. Those that had gotten themselves into such a mess that they had no hope in this generation or the next or the next to buy themselves out. The Lord provided something in the life of Israel so that people wouldn't be ensnared to their past, but could be free to a new future. Not because... Israel was going to carry it out. And as far as we know, they never really lived up to that promise. But because the Lord is the kind of God that sets His people free. Even the ones that have squandered their inheritance the worst, even they can find double portion and restoration from Him. While humanity cannot imagine such a world, a world of such scandalous forgiveness 
and absolution and clearing of all physical and spiritual debt. This is the world that Jesus Christ is actualizing for us lousy, sickly, poor, ungrateful, and unkind people. That's the world He's bringing about through Himself for us. This is the never-ending new year of the Lord's favor. And this is what He has on the docket for human history. Verse 2, it's both a day of God's vengeance on the evil and yet a day of God's comfort for those who mourn. See, whether we like to admit it or not, the Scriptures promise that God will wring the greedy dry and He will shower blessings on the needy. The Messiah will do this. He's the kind of God that can crown us in beauty despite us being covered in ashes. The ashes of this old year. The ashes of this old life. The only One who can wash us in festive oils rather than in bitter tears. The only One that can dress us up and clean clothes rather in despair. He's the only one that can take the dead husks of our old lives and resurrect it and plant us anew by streams of living water. Where, as David wrote in Psalm 1, this reminds us, this is where we read and celebrate and are transformed from what we once were because we live with God's Word making us new. Now, does that sound like a New Year's resolution that you personally can keep? Or does it sound like one that is being kept for you? See, try and hope as we might, we human beings cannot bring about this kind of jubilee for our society, much less ourselves. With all our best intentions, we can't bring this kind of freedom and forgiveness We just can't do it. We are so warped by sin and curved in on ourselves. So much so that when Jesus is announcing this good news of healing, of forgiveness, of restoration, when He says, God is doing this through me, when His own people heard Him say that, they wanted to kill Him. That's how crazy they thought it was that God could ever achieve something like this through Him. And likewise today, we are offended by that kind of grace if we're honest. By His gift. We have such a can-do spirit in this country. If only we invest right and, and don't squander our time and we work hard and save our money, we'll get what's coming to us. We believe that we earn all that we have. We brag about our achievements, our education, our families, our financial situation, and we seem to forget how little we actually have ever achieved by ourselves. Even when we set our minds to it. And we're even more forgetful that so many of the good things that we do have in this life were not earned or secured by our own power or our own wisdom, but rather were given to us by the grace of God who makes it rain on the just and the unjust. (laughs) We forget that. Jesus says blessings come to all kinds of people, even evil people. So let's not be in this new year the kind of prosperity-minded Christians that just think because life is going well for us, or our investments are doing well, but that necessarily means that we're obtaining God's favor. God's favor doesn't come through money. doesn't come through status. doesn't come through clout. doesn't come through help. God's favor comes through Jesus. And Jesus alone. We forget, and I think it makes us flippant towards those who are suffering those who are neglected, those who are poor or disadvantaged. We, we look at, down at such people. And yet, that's the ones that Jesus says, those are the ones that I'm coming to help. I'm going to set free the captives. I'm going to redeem the prisoners. I'm going to 
Cheer up the brokenhearted. I'm going to mend and heal the sick. And so for us to look down at people and our society that we think of as, as gross and unworthy is a Christless thing to do. And yet so common in our evangelical circles where we have a false piety. We come in here and we, we say that, oh, uh, we're sinners saved by grace, and then we go out to a world full of sinners and look at them with no grace, no mercy, no charity. Proving we don't really believe that we're sinners. We believe that we're better off. That we're a little bit more spiritually in tune. That we have a little bit more to offer God than they do. And yet the Scriptures could not be any clearer. (laughs) There is no help in us. We are miserable offenders. But God has mercy on people just like us. All we have this year, and all we will get this year, is by the favor of our long-suffering Lord. All we ever have, or will be, or enjoy, is because the Son of God did not count equality with the Father as something to be exploited, but emptied Himself, taking on the form of a slave and dying a criminal's death in our stead, so that we might have all the incomparable riches of God at our disposal. That's what real holiness looks like. That's what true faith and love and joy and hope look like. Not sort of the the false piety that we see in evangelical life, but the scandalous, self-exhausting, self emptying love that we see in Jesus. And it's because of Him alone that verse 6 we read that we will be called the Lord's priest. And the world will speak of us as ministers of our God. Again, not because, even if we take this back to the original context to which it was written for Israel. Isaiah is writing this prophecy. Isaiah 1 The Lord hates your feast. He can't stand your worship festivals. You neglect the, the, the weightier matters of the law. You don't, uh, you don't treasure, uh, mercy or grace or compassion. You don't advocate for the poor and the foreigner and the sick and the needy and the, and the, the fatherless and the widow. You just glorify yourself. The Lord's angry with them. Judgment is upon Israel. But by the end of the book, the story has changed. Is that because Israel has gotten her life together? No. It's because the Lord is sending His Anointed One to get their life together through His life for them. The same is said of the church. We are just like Israel, spiritually speaking. We are a mess. We are miserable offenders. If we are priests of our God, it is simply because He's accomplished that in us. And so, it is not because anything Israel has done, but because of God's mercy and favor that He said, you will serve as My priest. But serving as the Lord's priest, and we Protestant Christians believe in the priesthood of all believers, that everyone is a preacher of the Gospel. Everyone can pray for the needs of their church and their community and their world. We believe that. But if we are priests of our God, it's not an elevated position to be, <laughs> to be braggadocious about. To be a true priest of, of, of God means it will look a lot like Jesus. But we'll be self-sacrificing as Christians. It means that the the rich and the powerful of this world will meet us with scorn. As we are faithful to Jesus alone, we will be rejected from the halls of power, from the bastions of influence, if we follow in His humble way. But, in the end, even that will be righted. As the Lord says, all the hoarded wealth of the powerful will be given to the poor in spirit who follow Jesus rather than Caesar. 
They have no king. They have no president. They have no prime minister. The true disciples of God. They have none of those things but Christ. May that be true of us, church. That we are not lackeys to any political party. That we're not lackeys for any economic preference. That we're not lackeys for any sort of academic or philosophical or cultural vision for this world. But to be servants and priests of our Lord Jesus alone. Don't grow weary in doing good, church. I know 2022 has been a long year for many of you. For all of us in some ways. Don't grow weary in doing good. Don't grow weary in blessing those who revile you. Praying for those who persecute you. Turning the other cheek to those that would strike you down. Because on the worst days, when that seems all for naught, and life is too miserable to go on. Jesus came to you on those days to preach the good news that He is coming to free us from sin and death. The Lord who will do this in Isaiah 61 is one and the same with Jesus Christ, who, verse 8, loves justice and hates robbery and injustice. In the end, He will be faithful to His people and reward you for suffering and persevering on in Him. The Lord does not overlook you. He doesn't miss what you're going through. He doesn't uh, allow that to go by unnoticed even when we feel like He does. In the end, you will be rewarded for your faithfulness. And He will say to you, well done good and faithful servant. But only if you follow in the way of Jesus. You will be vindicated for your generosity. You will be compensated for your compassion. When you relinquish your hatred and violence and retaliation, God will give you exactly what you need and then some. God has made a new covenant of grace and glory for His people. It's such a powerful covenant, we read in this passage, that it not only blesses Israel, but it blesses all the nations of the world, all the peoples of the world, all the different variety of human beings in this world that turn to recognize the Lord. And so, if all of this is true, church, We can, with Isaiah in verse 10, rejoice greatly in the Lord. Exult in our God, for He has clothed us with garments of salvation. He has wrapped us in a robe of righteousness. (laughs) Not our righteousness. Not our justice. When we fail new year after new year to keep our resolutions, to become more spiritual, Or just even something simple, like lose that little bit of weight to fit back into our old clothes. We can take great comfort that we have been wrapped in brand new clothes of Christ's own righteousness. Secured for us on a cross of all places. While He hung there naked and beaten and ashamed, He wrapped us in the great warm blanket of His love and forgiveness. And He has made us to look as handsome as a groom wearing a turban, or for us in the Western world, a tux on their wedding day. He's made us to look as beautiful as a bride that adorns herself in jewelry. These are the same people who just moments ago were sitting in dust and ashes and poverty, and yet through the Messiah, they're now adorned in God's best clothing. His righteousness and glory shared with and for them. But folks, make no mistake about it, we didn't do any of this ourselves. And make no mistake further, we cannot do any of this ourselves. We may be comfortable saying, we didn't get to this place on our own. 
<laughs> but we'll lie to ourselves and say, if I work really hard, I can make myself what I want to be. That's just as big of a lie. But the year of the Lord's favor, this year, as every year, the year of the freeing jubilee has been done for us in Jesus. And so now as you enter into 2023 with all the burdens of your life, knowing that you still have to deal with that tough family member or, 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 or leaning in and learning even now as what to do as a parent or, or maybe as a, a, a child learning how to be obedient to your parents. None of the kids responded on that one. But when we go, when we come into this life this new year with all the problems that we have, we can know that even though we're burdened, we are free indeed. Free to share in our abundance of blessing with those in need. We're free even in the limited resources we have to give freely to those that are poor and suffering. We are free to love boldly those who are imprisoned or sickly or lonely, or sorrowful, and we can proclaim to them the good news that Christ is even now setting all us captives free. For as the earth produces growth, and as a garden springs, so the Lord causes praise in us and all the nations sing. Should nothing of our efforts stand, no legacy survive, unless the Lord does raise the house in vain its builders strive. All glory be to Christ our King. All glory be to Christ. We'll take His cup of kindness yet. All glory be to Christ. Let's pray. Lord, this new year is another year of Your eternal favor. Help us to put all our trust in You and to be shaped more and more into the image of Jesus Christ every day. For it's in His name we pray and ask all these things. Amen.